So, so interestingly, um, you know, this is something that you can you can find in some of the literature that's been written around 9-11. Um, when apparently, allegedly, when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed first comes up with the idea for what would be known as the planes plot, um, he approached uh, Osama bin Laden with it in 1996 first. And bin Laden and like the shura of I wanted a better term for Al Qaeda at the time, they rejected the idea. They said that the, the loss of life was uh, was too great, that the collateral damage from such an operation would be too huge to justify such an operation. That wouldn't be within the the accepted boundaries of Islamic law to carry out an act like this. Asalaamu Alaikum everyone As you can tell we have a uh, special guest today It was not that special but all, all our guests are special uh, We have the doc- doctor now Asim Qureshi Asalaamu Alaikum Asim Asalaamu Alaikum Asim That was the old uh, warming up the mics I think they're adequately warm now Sit a bit close to mine um, Asim how are you? How's uh, lockdown going? Yeah, everything's, everything's good So uh, yeah. you were just talking about having a standing desk Which is uh, quite clever yeah, it's it's still a relatively recent um, thing, but it you know, alhamdulillah, it it just yeah. gets you to to work a little bit differently, it gets you on your feet for most of the day, you know. So alhamdulillah, it's a uh, it's a nice addition to the, uh, the the workflow. So have your uh, your schedule must be exactly the same though, because you, you during lockdown when, didn't you used to work from home most days anyway yes yeah no that's that's exactly right alhamdulillah i um i'm pretty much exactly as was uh before lockdown started except the only difference is that i'm not traveling for work so usually about maybe 10 days um every month and a half i'd be abroad um yeah. as part of one investigation or another but that's completely stopped which is actually be kind of nice um just to be able to have that consistent time with my children which i haven't had since mm. You know, they since they were born in 2008, <laughs> you know, actually, you know, actually, this is the longest I've I've been grounded in the UK yeah. since 2005. So it's been a bit bit of a, a different period for me. Nice, nice. And Schedule Seven wasn't to blame for that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's the, it's nice that it's kind of 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 the making of something else that isn't yeah. entirely linked no to racism. <laughs> So one of the reasons why uh, we wanted, to, I mean, we wanted to talk to you for a while anyway. Um, this is the first time we've spoke since you got your PhD, mashallah. So congratulations. Um, before is you, this the first time we've that, spoken. Yeah, I think so. Uh, I mean, on camera. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe. Before that, it was um, we did a big discussion called one-on-one called uh, "Can Muslims Do Their Own Politics?" That's um, right. That yes. That was a good yes, one. Yeah. Yes, yeah. But you were just yes. a lowly brother then. <laughs> Brother Asim Qureshi. <laughs> now you're uh, you're still a lowly brother, but mashallah, you have a few few more letters and uh, alphabets after your name and before your name, mashallah. Uh, mm. But um, yeah, one of the reasons why we wanted to talk today was by the time this goes out, it's going to be the anniversary of 9/11, um, 11 September. Um, and we thought we were thinking, should we make a big deal about it? Should we? You know, um, do a podcast about it, and whilst we're kind of wary of the whole kind of exceptionalizing of certain types of violence and stuff, uh, the fact of the matter is, it is something that's usually trending, and uh, we thought, how about we discuss it through our own uh, lens, through our own paradigm, our mm-hmm. own microphones, uh, and um, what better person to bring on than uh, Dr. Asim Qureshi, who's uh, been working not to not to link you or anything to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's start that again. Uh, what pe- better person to bring on than uh, Asim Qureshi? So um, let's just start off with something light and easy. Uh, who did it? <laughs> that's, a, <laughs> that's a question I get asked all <laughs> over the world. Um, you know, and alhamdulillah, I've had some small um, link to um, investigating the the case behind. 9/11. I've done some research around that yeah. um, for, for various people over the year, last year, especially the last decade. And look, I think we just have to be frank and and you know and say that 
it's very, very, very likely that, you know, a group of Muslims were, were involved and responsible. Now, there's a trial currently taking place in Guantanamo Bay where the men who are accused of um, operationally masterminding and being involved in it, they're, they're, they're standing trial. And so I think we have to um, really wait until the end of that process uh, to really get to the to the facts. But of course, you know, there is a 9-11 commission report, mm. uh, despite the problems that were associated with it. Um, you know, it, it did go in through quite a great bit of detail. Yes, uh, some of that evidence that was presented was based uh, around torture that was extracted from, you know, people like Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, you know, mm. was waterboarded 183 times in the space of one month, uh, for those of you who don't know what a waterboarding is, it's when you're placed on a, uh, a platform like this with your head slightly lowered, it's on a wheel, um, water is poured down your throat uh, until the point of death. Now there's a doctor monitoring your vital signs right next to the you as the torch is taking place. And at the point of death, they press a button, the thing flings forward the board flings forward and all the, the water that was drowning you come, or makes you feel like you were drowning comes spilling out. Mm. So like he was subjected to 183 mock executions uh, over the space of that month. Um, and so, of course, the, the evidence against him is somewhat tainted by uh, well, <laughs> massively tainted by yeah. um, that experience. But that's not, of course, the only evidence that they have. So it will be interesting to know what outside of the torture what information they, they had. I mean, I, and I guess as that process goes on, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll learn a lot more. But I mean, one thing I'll say that, you know, I, I remember being in Pakistan in 2005, giving a lecture uh, alongside uh, um, a, a Jewish lawyer and the students in the room, um, <laughs> one of the questions they asked were like, why weren't there any Jews in uh, the World Trade Center? And I, I, I felt obliged to speak up um, at that point and say, look, you know, I've been to the, the World Trade Center site uh, in New York, you know, I've seen the list of names. There are many, many, many Jewish names on the list of the deceased mm. that are there. So this notion that, you know, these conspiracy theories that are out there, you know, they're really, um, uh, yeah, they, they, they're, they're too much mm. and we shouldn't really be going into them at all. Like the fact is that, um, in many ways, America was caught, uh, unaware now, whether or not, the, they knew more about the intelligence and they let on that they did. I don't know that. Like, you know, it's hard to trust the U.S. government with anything, um, they say, really. Mm -hmm. But as far as we know right now, there are men on that, that there are on trial for having uh, masterminded it. We know that Muslim men were involved in the hijacking for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's that's undisputed. And so we'll have to see where this goes from here. Yeah. So all these conspiracy theories, I mean, there's loads, as you know. Uh, and Muslims, they, uh, I don't know, brothers and sisters are some sometimes quite uh, quite partial to the uh, the juicy conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. um, does it matter? Does it matter if anyone? Because a lot of people they they enter these rabbit holes about consp conspiracy theories and so forth. But did, would it would it make a difference? Um, kind of. Materially? I mean, I, I think. If one you know, if, was a, if there was a conspiracy that had been there, I think it would have made a, lot, a slight bit of difference in mm. terms of how people understood the the response and the reaction that then took mm. place, the invasion of Afghanistan, um, so on and so forth. I think people would have thought very, very differently about those things because, you know, unfortunately, um, you know, many Muslims around the world uh, very unfortunately supported the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, I'm not saying they all did. I mean, mm. we're talking about those in power, at least, mm. of our countries, of our institutions, they they turned, they are either complicit in their acceptance of it, or uh, at the very least, they, they turned a blind eye. I remember meeting Yasser Arafat uh, in, in the West Bank in 2004 and asking him about kind of the way that Palestine was viewed, you know, increasingly through the lens of the war on terror um after 9-11 environment and you know he 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 was he for some reason he went on a complete tangent which actually he did quite a lot in the three-hour meeting but you know he said look i was the first 
Muslim leader to call up George W. Bush to extend my condolences for what happened on 9-11. And of course, you know, I, I think extending condolences is fine. But the question is, is you know, how, how do we re respond and react to that? I think if, if there had been a conspiracy, of course, it would change the way that people would think about it. But, the, uh, you know, the reality is, is that what happened, you know, happened uh, very much with Muslims involved. Um, it <clears> seems... <throat> As things stand right now, that Muslims planned it. It seems that America was caught unaware, even though there was some intelligence that they could have perhaps potentially acted on. Um, but yeah, we have to accept that fact, you know. And I don't think it should. I don't think it means anything beyond what it is. I don't think we should att start attaching larger meaning to it in the way that the whole world has, which is to like put the, the whole of the Muslim world on, under this security lens. Um, and that's really the problem here. It's polarization, I'm, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm much more interested in, like, I guess, how we've taken meaning from that moment. Like, you know, how, how do we internalize what happened on 9 11? Like, where, where were you? Do you remember Do you remember the day? Like, I very v vividly do, but, you yeah, know, I'm interested I was, how other people. I was just a youth in them days. I was, yeah, in, well, I was, in, I I was in school. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you barely got in your white yeah. in your head, man. No. <laughs> It's actually my birthday today, you know that. I'm officially really? officially in my 30s now. Well, happy birthday, I guess. So, I say officially, I'm 35, but now it's now it's now I'm properly in my 30s. So before <laughs> I was just kind of late 20s and and a bit. But anyway, right. I was I was on my way to um what year year 10 or something? In, in yeah, school. Yeah, 10. So you are school. how old? 14 15 yeah, I was I was uh 15 16 yeah okay um and just you know saw some stuff on the TV and the newspapers didn't no one really spoke about it that much um really? even though it was that day but uh -huh. then you know because we didn't have like mobile phones or anything in class so a few people might have seen something on the news before they came into school but it was like maybe the next day um when people saw the news and stuff um it was like 8 something in the morning our time wasn't it Yes, right. It was yeah. early morning. Yeah. Where were you? I was. Uh, I was. Uh, uh, yeah, so and, uh, up, so I was still. I was still living with my uh, parents. It was the second year of my law degree, um, mm. and yeah, I, I, I vividly recall. You're still a young kind of, whippersnapper. Sorry. You're still a yeah. young whippersnapper. <laughs> and and uh, I was on MSN Messenger. There used to oh, be a I thing. Remember that. Children, <laughs> children. Uh, there used to be a thing called MSN Messenger before there was WhatsApp and. You know, Telegram and Signal and all these other social media ways of communicating. Yeah. And my cousin, who was in um, Pakistan at the time, he messaged me and said, T go and turn on your TV. Something big's happened in America. And so then, you know, I ran downstairs and switched on the news and we started. To, and at this stage, only the first tower had been hit. So mm. oh, I remember. Wow. So like, you're watching it like live? Yeah, so we, we saw, oh, no. you know, pretty much uh, the second um, plane go into the uh, towers live. And yeah, I mean, I guess I guess I, I knew this was significant at that moment. Um, I knew that this was something that was going to be serious. Um, but did you, I mean, did, as a you know 15 year old, did you really understand that this was this is something that was going to potentially alter you no know, the world? No way. No, I was right. Just, you okay. Know, I was so I'm engaged interested. in other pursuits at that age. <laughs> I, you know, I'm always interested by, you know, that generation um, of, of people who maybe kind of understood a little bit, but weren't necessarily fully aware of like the wider politics that were going on in the world. Um, I, you know, I, must, I must say, though, I was when I when I was watching the news, I was watching uh, that clip with George Bush and uh, an imam and a rabbi and a priest or something, mm -hmm. and he was like, you know, being all, um, you know, kind of, uh, um, uh, what's the word, showing kind of solidarity, and this is, you know, it's not about Muslims, it's someone else, and you know, it's uh, he was mentioned the God of Abraham, Jesus, and Muhammad, and that kind that that phrase. Mm -hmm. I thought that was quite nice of him. He must be a nice guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean. <laughs> Salam guys. Sorry to butt in. Eh? But if you're enjoying this podcast, please head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help us make more. And if you're not enjoying it, head over anyway and help us make better ones.
So I what 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 changed from that? Was that just uh was he fully like neocon fully like uh war, war kind of uh uh war back then or was he kind of influenced a lot by so uh, I mean, by the, the neocons and stuff in his um, around him, around him? If you if you um read certain books and kind of watch um movies like W and um the one about Dick Cheney, you can see that there is a there's already a, a like a uh, a sentiment that, that that's there. I mean, of course, America has been like living its Orientalist fantasy for mm. um, you know for decades, if not you know at least a couple of centuries, where you know they they have always seen the Muslim world as other. Um, but that that kind of fits in a much wider, larger narrative of the way that the West has interacted with the Muslim world um, mm. and, and seen it as a, as a resource for plunder more than anything else. So that's kind of like, there, there is a, there is a discourse that's par for the course yeah. for America and whether you're Democrat or Republican, you know, you know th- there is a certain hegemony of discourse that will always be there uh, yeah. and will, will, will continue in the same vein, regardless of who is in charge and, and who is doing what, what, but um, I think it definitely presented um a real opportunity for the, the most hawkish sentiments mm-hmm. of the American political establishment to really express themselves. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm, you know, people like Kofa Black, um, you know, a high-ranking member of the CIA, saying that the gloves were off now, and that's that was the environment really that yeah. because that that they had been attacked on their soil because you know um, almost three thousand people have lost their lives that anything goes. That they can do anything that they want, um, because they had never experienced anything like this. You know, people who experience, you know, mass tragedies, um, it's never easy for them. Like in other parts of the world, it's never easy for them. Whatever the tragedy is, it never gets easier. Um, but they have a a way of understanding things outside of like a, a spectacular moment, where, which America didn't have. Um, in its living memory, a reference for on its own soil. Uh, I think what really brought that home to me most um, was a book uh, called The Eleventh Day, which describes in detail um, and th- that whole scene of carnage, mm. from what's going on inside the tower to what's happening on the ground, and in a very humanizing way as well. Like I actually, I, I, I walked away from that book feeling extremely upset. Because I never, you know, for me, 9-11 was more about, you know, the the 12th of September yeah. and the, the rhetoric that was coming out. Security, I mean, and at this stage, I was studying international law. Like, I just started studying international mm. law. I was really into it. Um, and so all of this became very, very contemporary to what I was studying. It was like, oh, right, these are the, the, the big debates that are happening right now. And so I was thinking of, about it much more from the perspective of the reaction and the response and how America was going to invade Afghanistan and how it was making all these intimations towards, you know, more hawkish policy towards the Muslim world. Um, but, you know, having read The Eleventh Day many years later, you kind of get a, 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 an understanding of the severe trauma that especially those who experienced it directly went through. Yeah. I mean, like, you're talking about people dropping from the top of a building at such a high rate that their bodies don't flatten when they hit, they explode. And they, they're they hitting firemen, like firemen's arms are like being cut off by these falling mm-hmm. appendages as they're coming down. And so you, you get a, a, a sense for the carnage of what took place on that day in a way that I hadn't fully appreciated, I'll have to admit, before reading that book. Mm-hmm. And then you get a sense of, oh, okay, right. It, it, for them, it is an exceptional moment. It is this deeply traumatizing moment. It is one that's going to leave an indelible mark on their psyche. And so, you know, what does that mean? Now, of course, their entire reaction has been to vilify the whole of the Muslim world and to securitize us and exceptionalize us and, and whatever. So nothing, excuse, nothing will ever excuse their response. But it's first, it's important for us to understand that this was a moment that was truly exceptional for them. It's also important to separate who them are, who they are. So right. those who were actually 
uh, experience trauma first or second hand, you know, themselves or their family members and stuff, they're not necessarily the ones who are doing the, you know, the policy making and the decisions that 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 um, vilify and that um, securitize and that otherwise, uh, you know, um, Muslims as a reaction to that. And oh, there's many families actually who quite the opposite are actively campaigning against America's kind of. Uh, foreign domestic policy, especially against um, Muslims. And we saw that with 7-7 as well, a number of the families, yeah. you know, who were brave enough to say, like, you know, don't do this. Um, Jack Merritt's father more recently, you know, coming out uh, saying, you know, the, the, the same thing about, you know, don't don't use this in order to bring extra legislation in these moments. Yeah. That we see. So th- there, are, there are many people who are like that, you know, alhamdulillah, that they're, they're there, but unfortunately they're in a minority. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, sad that it's a part of our language anyway. Naturally, that we uh, we refer to things like like America, <laughs> but what we mean sometimes is you know the people who might be victims, innocent people. But uh, in another context, America refers to its its ruling establishment and stuff. And uh, I'm just wondering, maybe that's uh, that's out of design. You know, for for years of 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 shaping our usage of certain words. You know. Talking about international law, for example, you, you studied and you know how we how we talk about other nations and peoples, right? Um, it's at once kind of grouping them together and separating them from us, you know. Uh, and I'm just thinking, is there another way to go about uh, go about that? So we have we have a nation, a concept of ummah, mm-hmm. right? Uh, something that transcends these borders. We have a notion of, you know, a common humanity. Uh, Uthman, Dr. Uthman Latif speaks a lot about that, about human codes of recognition and um, recognizing that. So, but the the whole the the whole enterprise of the nation of the you know the uh, the state, right? Uh, America, France, whatever, uh, UK. <laughs> so you know, imagine to so someone to so someone uh, in fr- sitting in France. They'll say Asim Qureshi is the UK, and they'll talk about uh, England or the UK or, or Britain, uh, and it's just really weird how we can how we just kind of let that slide in our normal conversations and almost. I mean, in the room. I'm not sure if that's being like, um, if that really captures what's going on when we use that terminology. I don't think. I think we know that there's a certain ubiquity to power when we speak about. America or France or the UK. I don't think anybody thinks of Arsene Qureshi when they say UK, right? If they're thinking about me, they might say Arsene Qureshi is from the UK. He's British. He has very British characteristics. Mm. You know, he's very sarcastic in the English language, right? Whatever the case might be. Mm. But I don't think when they say the UK and its policies, the UK and its foreign policy, the UK and its approach, that they, that the image that is invoked in their mind is somebody like me or somebody like you. Yeah, or I agree. It's not, it's not a direct thing, but it's something that's, that's kind of crept into our uh, language. It might, mm-hmm. might have been over centuries, I don't know, but it's just a bit, it's just a bit odd, you know? And it, and it, 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 it kind of links to the whole... Um, the, the the a little bit to the 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 justification narrative you know that people people who justify 911 and mm-hmm. amongst some uh, groups and 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 uh, even islamic preachers and stuff you know because they are americans look what mm-hmm. they did to us you know um obviously not saying that you're uh, you're on some kind of continuum at same well like we're on the same continuum as them but it's just like a necessary prerequisite to 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 br- to paint uh, to paint them with a different brush, a broad brush, you know, that inevitably is going to kind of paint over any re- any l- a higher resolution kind of differences between themselves. And I feel that the yeah, only the I only thing the point. only people that benefit from that are the people in power, because when they're attacked, they can say, "Oh, look, we were attacked." Right. When they do something wrong, <laughs> they said, "You know, well, they invoke patriotism and nationalism and that kind of stuff." To of course, of course. Uh, uh, but anyway, the you mentioned um, you mentioned waterboarding mm-hmm. uh, of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. So uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was he, and and what was his? What do you think his role? I mean, I know you, you mentioned you can't really talk about ongoing case, but 
what was what is his alleged role in the uh, i mean they they the claim that he's masterminded the the operation that you know he he um, conceived of it in the first place his um nephew is ramzi yusuf who um was convicted of being involved um with the 1993 world trade center bombing um so they're you know they have some link to operations in the past there are other plots that he's accused of being involved in as well like the bajinka plot um and even um the execution of the the jewish journalist uh, american jewish journalist daniel pearl so there is there's like a a number of allegations mm. in relation to him and and his case. I mean, he's originally from, um, you know, kind of ethnically from from Balochistan, um, but grew up in in Kuwait um, as a as as a Balochi, so a non Kuwaiti uh, living mm. uh, in Kuwait. So yeah, it's just interesting that um, you know the kind of trajectories that that people go on in their lives. And Allah Hualim, as I said, we'll, we'll find out more as the as, mm. as the case proceeds. But you know, there are there are so many different aspects to to the way in which um, not only him but those around him were treated as well. So, for example, one of the things that's claimed is that Afi Siddiqui was first picked up because mm. she gave up her name. Now, that's never been presented in a court. Um, that's just an allegation that was um, put out there. Um, we also um, know that his his children were arrested and were used as part of the torture against him. So they were uh, abused themselves, and they were the the idea that the CIA had was to use them almost as a as a tool in order to get him to confess um, to whatever they wanted him to confess to. So I mean, you know, I think regardless of what our political leanings might be, regardless of you know, where we stand theologically on these matters, I think all of us can agree that you don't take a five-year-old and a seven-year-old and torture them in front of their father in order to extract confessions. Like there are there are absolute red lines that we have to hold on to, that we have to maintain. I mean, torture is a red line anyway, and it, it is and it has to be and it always, inshallah, will be. And as Muslims, we have to take a very strong stance on that. But, you know, there's just something about them involving children in this now of course the half of the argument is that well there were children who were affected by by 9 11 right but you know of course that's um that that's a race to the bottom uh, yeah. argument so they actually tortured his children yeah front, they did in front they of did. him to so what does that actually we don't do know though? all the details of that just yet um but i think i think there needs to be much more work to find out exactly what happened um, you know, with them, but we, we, you know, one of the things that we do know is that they were they were severely mm. uh, uh, harmed and traumatized by what they went through. So, surely, what's what's the justification for that people use for that kind of uh, behavior torture? Because surely, even on a practical level, materially, it's not it, it's not going to extract the truth. It's going to extract what whatever you want them to say. Right. I mean, so there's a there's a whole tradition of, um, you know, kind of lawyers who got involved with the whole ticking time bomb um, thesis. The, the most yeah. famous probably advocate uh, for it was a um, uh, was an, a, a celebrated uh, so-called human rights lawyer by the name of uh, Alan Dershowitz, who wrote a book called okay. How Terrorism Works. So he really, I guess, puts forward the main um, thesis for this, which is around um you've got a ticking time bomb you've got to get information out quickly and get the information quickly in order to stop the the, the bomb from going off right and therefore you need to use whatever techniques are at, are available to you in order to save lives the problem is is that it's a fictional scenario like nobody can ever point to a single scenario that 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 suggests that um uh that torture uh, worked in order to stop uh, a a bomb from going off. That's just reality, you know. So even if you even if you don't concentrate on ethics and you just concentrate on efficacy, right? Then you you end up in the situation where yeah. like, well, you, you can't even prove your own case. Like, there's if if we just take it from from whether or not it's effective yeah. to use this at all, then that's that case is never been proven. And one of the things that came out of 
uh, a Senate committee report into the CIA's use of torture that was uh, led by uh, Senator Feinstein. She, you know, her, the, the report that her and her colleagues came out with, you know, effectively showed that all these arguments that the CIA were making around the how effective their torture was were completely uh, were complete nonsense. You know, and so, you know, we are in the situation that um, that argument has been made by celebrated human rights people. Um, you know, we can't forget that, that the human rights community itself has been complicit in um, justifying the use of torture. Of course, it's been other parts of the community have been trying to hold those people to account. But, you know, unfortunately, people like Dershowitz are still celebrated to this day. But me, personally, I prefer to, 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 to maintain my focus on ethics. You know, these people talk about, you know, bombs leading to like these existential crises. And for me, there was never in our history as Muslims an existential crisis that that we as Muslims face more than Badr. Badr is like, you know, to the extent the Prophet and puts his hands up at the eye and says that if you say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that if you don't grant us victory to the, on this day, then there will be no one left on this earth to worship you. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the that's his invocation. Because he recognizes that, like, when we're talking about existential crisis, this is an existential yeah. crisis that they were having, right? And so when some of the Sahaba capture two boys who are from the Quraysh and they, they beat them for information prior to Badr starting, the Prophet says, I'm full well knowing the crisis that they might face, right? And the Prophet says, I'm rebuking them and saying that, you know, when when they told when the boys told the truth you beat them and when they lied you set them free yeah <laughs> you know, as an example of like how there there is no efficacy in this that this mm. abuse it leads to um these types of answers being given right yeah. like if, if there was ever a time within islam's history where you know the prophet might have said have... you know like you know we're, we're, we're in a difficult situation right now, right? Do what you need to in order to get, get stuff done. Okay, that would have been the yeah. moment to do it. But he doesn't, right? Yeah. The process maintains his ethics in that moment. And, you know, I think because po often people talk about that hadith, they, se they don't talk about the context within which it's taking place, which is Badr. SubhanAllah, I never knew that it was uh, Battle of Badr. Right. Um, and, and ironically, when you do start to compromise these ethics... That is a greater value to your, <laughs> a greater threat to your, uh, to your existence in the grand scheme of things than, right? Uh, than the thing that you're uh, kind of, reportedly sort of kind of uh, protecting yourself against. You well, isn't that? isn't that the the story of the post nine eleven reaction yeah. by the West, that mm -hmm. almost anything, any value that they purported to hold on to daily, <laughs> they've they've sacrificed for the sake of. You know, securitizing uh, uh, entire communities. You know, I, I I can't think of a single value that they claim and profess to hold on to. You know, based on their own um, kind of reverence for liberalism and liberal philosophy, that you know they can say yes, we held on to this strongly and tightly, like you know, uh, you know, as our central ethics. I can't I can't think of one that they haven't compromised. Yeah. Salam guys, me again, reminding you to head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to keep the lights on on Islam21c. We pride ourselves on being independent and being funded by the grassroots community. And um, it's, similar, it's similar to the arguments of those who were justifying the attacks as well, because um, they wouldn't just, you know, their arguments weren't uh, hey, let's go and uh, attack this sovereign nation that's done nothing to us. Their argument was framed within: this is a crisis that they, you know, we're protecting our nation. We have to strike them just like they're striking us, or right. and couching it in, in that exceptional kind of language that this isn't normal um, day-to-day business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I I completely understand what you're saying there, and I think I've made those arguments myself in the, and in fact i know i've made that argument myself in the past um i i think where i've come to in my in my work in my life is trying to understand each episode of violence within the full complexity of its context i don't think it's necessarily helpful for us to say well you know these things are two sides of the same coin because 
all violence, you know, it, it takes place in a, in a very, very, very specific context mm. to how that violence emerged. Um, you can talk about, say, like maybe some similarities or whatever else, but I think generally we should just try and understand each phenomenon yeah. for, what it is, for what it is. And of course, you know, 9-11 doesn't just start. Like the world didn't begin on 9-11, which is unfortunately how sometimes where this world is presented that yeah. somehow there was 9-11 and nothing came before it. Yeah. You know, there was there was no colonialism. There was no empire. There was no, um, you know, American support for Israel. There was no American support for dictators across um, the Middle East. That Sykes-Picot never happened. That, you know, like we're told, you know, and, and this is part of the refrain of um, apologists for racism and colonization that we have, especially today in the UK, right? Which is the past is a foreign country, got nothing to do with us now, right? Everyone's moved on from those days. And if you kind of follow scholars like Priyam uh, Gopal, um, you know, and the way that she gets attacked online for trying to maintain a link to history to try and help explain that history is important for us to understand where we you know where all these moments come from then you then you'll see that ultimately the the the, the discourse is there in order to maintain power in the way it is it's not about learning lessons yeah. it's not about trying to move on it's not about trying to heal it's purely about silencing anything that detracts from their presentation of themselves as the saviors of the world. And and I think that that is something that we have to constantly call out. When you say their, their presentation of themselves, who are you referring to there? Of course, those, those, you know, those in power. Mm. You know, I, I don't think, I mean, you know, and this is, and I guess this comes back to, you know, when, when we talk about um, two sides of the same coin, right? Mm-hmm. Part of the reason why I don't like that that phrase is because we're talking about those with power against those without power. Mm. Um, you know, in, in in the UK, which is the example that you and I know best, mm. right? We know our Muslim institutions. We know our masajid. We know who's who in the community. Like the whole notion of six degrees of separation is a bit of a nonsense for us, right? Like, <laughs> like two degrees two of degrees. cousin. <laughs> <laughs> right, with one or two degrees of separation, you pretty much know any Muslim in the UK. Right, there's only three million of us, and we have very, very close knit networks in many ways. So the, the idea that that any kind of desire to carry out um, political violence or terrorist atrocities that has a platform mm. that the community is receiving regularly, okay, uh, on a consistent basis, is a nonsense. I can't think of a single masjid that preaches this narrative, that pushes this, that mm. that that thinks like this. Quite the opposite, in fact. I think our masjid bend over backwards in order to try and prove that they have no affiliation and association to anything like that whatsoever. The other side, so when we talk about two sides, right? So the other side they say of like terrorism is is like far right racism or whatever else, right? Who owns the narrative? of the far right who owns the debates around immigration about uh you know kind of anti-blackness around exceptionalizing and securitizing muslims who owns these these narratives and it's and you you can't say well you would never see any of this stuff outside of like um 4chan forums right that's the only place that exists you know like they say about about muslims that muslims go on online to get radicalized you know so-called radicalized that's where they get all their radicalization um supposedly in their mind that's not the case with well, then you just turn on PMQs. you just need to turn you just need to like listen to a politician speech you just need to listen to sajid javed or priti patel or boris johnson right you need to listen to nick ferrari you know, these people have platforms that go out to millions. Mm. And that is where the, the far right get their narrative from. When they when you read their 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 literature, you know, yeah. people like Anders Breivik, who are they praising? They're praising the Douglas Murrays. Yeah. They're praising the Melanie Phillips, the people who are given national platforms to spew bile against others, right? And so when we think about you know who owns what narrative and who they are in this case right when I, when i speak of they i'm thinking uh, i'm i'm talking about structural power 
that has a a hegemony of narrative around who everyone else is whether they're black yeah. people whether they're poor people whether they're muslims right they have a a a consistent narrative that filters through you cannot say the same thing about muslims yeah. you cannot say the same thing about black people <laughs> they don't have those platforms they don't have the ability to spread those types of messages in the same way if you'd like the ability visit islamtunity.com forward slash donate <laughs> to do your part today uh okay so um so just uh, winding back a bit, just to give uh, the young, young, uh, the, the youths like myself a bit of a history lesson here. Uh, so you talked about uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Some people might be thinking, well, I've never heard of him. All I've heard is Bin Laden. Isn't he the guy who, uh, who did it? So how, how, are they, how are those two connected and, and what was his role? So, so interestingly, um, you know, this is something that you can, you can find in some of the literature that's been written around 9-11. When apparently, allegedly, when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed first comes up with the idea for what would be known as the Plains Plot, um, he approached uh, Osama bin Laden with it in 1996 first. And bin Laden and like the shura of, if I wanted a better term, for Al Qaeda at the time, they rejected the idea. They said that the, the loss of life was, uh, was too great. That the collateral damage from such an operation would be too huge to justify such an operation. That wouldn't be within the the accepted boundaries of Islamic law to carry out an act like this. So it's interesting that um, after the, the the bombing of the Ashifa factory in 1998, particularly, and mm. after is that the, Sudan? In Sudan, right? That's right. And after the cruise missiles um, that was sent by Clinton into Afghanistan and Pakistan um, that, that took many lives, that the, it seems that the locus somewhat changed for the way that they were thinking about, um, you know, what, what, what was and was not within the boundaries of acceptability. A really interesting book to read is called uh, The Exile uh, by Kathy Scott Clark actually details much of this history and in particular it's got really fascinating um testimony from uh, abu hafsa al-muritani who was part of the, the shura council and he gives a lot of detail into you know how all of this took place what the conversations were and and he was a he was a dissenter himself mm. within that group um you know he was somebody who didn't agree with the with with the plot when it when it first emerged or even with it being uh, carried through so this high like, like, idea of um these crazy old you know brown men in a cave in Tora Bora like uh fanatically um trying to destroy the world like an iron man and, one you know it has it has nuance to it yeah Right, that I think is important for us to learn from, um, if we're if if we're serious about trying to stop um, these cycles of violence that are taking place. Right, mm. if if we want to reduce everybody to carb out, cardboard cutouts to say that well, you know, they're they're all these like crazy glazed glazed eyed, um, you know, fanatical Muslims who are out to kill every single person they they see. Then I don't think we'll ever get to the story. I think I don't think we'll ever learn anything about. You know why 9/11 happened. You know why yeah. political violence continues to happen. What the complexities of people's lives are. You know, and you know, I'm 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 the type of person in my in my working life that even when somebody from the far right, for example, commits a very very violent act, I don't want to just leave it as oh, it's because he's a racist. I want to know everything that I can about it's that person. That's why you know. Disturbed. You know, it's, when, it's, it's, it's ironic that, of course, you know, I've been castigated publicly by the by the Daily Mail and many other news outlets for, for trying to provide a more humane and human understanding of the trajectories that certain violent individuals have been on, mm. whether it's Jihadi John or whoever it might be, uh, Olaki, you know, many people, that they have a complexity to their story. And, of course, you know, I'm like called a terrorist sympathizer and apologist, this, that, and the other, because of it, for trying to understand how these trajectories work. Um, but of course, when Tommy Mayer killed Joe Cox and the Daily Mail 
Martin's headline was something along the lines of, you know, him being like this lovely person who became man. disenfranchised because uh, Joe Cox was uh, giving like housing to immigrants or something along those lines. Yeah. It was like this really, and you know, for me, it was like, that's what you should be doing for everybody. It, it wasn't, you know, obviously like I, I saw the double standard straight yeah. away, but my instinct wasn't you guys are terrible people for doing this. My, 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 my response was you guys are terrible people for not doing this for everyone. For not giving everyone that same mitigation, for not trying to think through the complexity of people's lives and understand what are the root causes of how they get to the places that they are, that's what's important here. That well, ta- yeah, I mean tabloids—they always get a, a bad uh, rep, you know, that they're very simplistic or they're very, uh, they feel like they're very uh, unintelligent or whatever. But it's very—it's a very intellectual job. Of uh, you know being a tabloid uh, headline writer or something because it's actually managed complexity. When you need to put the complexity in, you you put it when it when it serves your interests and your values and stuff. And when you need to come across and write like a some kind of knuckle dragging Neanderthal, then then that's how you uh, that's how you do it. So they're actually very you know uh, intelligent and uh, and and and. and um, shrewd kind of uh, journalists and, and editors who do who do that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. um, you know, to write for someone who w- with a with a you know year three level of English or something, <laughs> and at the same time put put th- put these uh, Im- embed these messages uh, messages in there. Um, so th- that's the first time I heard what you just said about the uh, Bin Laden saying no and then saying uh, yes after the, uh, yes, the those attacks. That's mm-hmm. quite. Um, Quite an indictment then on um, on U.S. foreign policy then, um, in terms of obviously not saying uh, you know just to blame or whatever, but in terms of the role that foreign policy does have in that that uh, complex mixture that that precipitates pr- political violence. How come this isn't yeah, something we heard uh, we've heard more about this particular example? Is this something that came out recently or? No, no, no. I mean, it's been known for a while. Like, I mean, if you read through the, the various literature that's out there, then um, you'll see uh, a lot of this stuff. Look, I think Bin Laden made it clear many times, you know, in his interview with Robert Fisk, the famous one interview, you know, he, he very, very specifically lays out, you know, like asked the question, why, why have we never attacked Sweden? I remember that, yeah. It's a, it's a very famous line, but kind of gets to almost to the rub of this. You know, it's one of the reasons why I, I do prefer to use the term political violence, because ultimately, you know, for me, when you when you look at every single case of of violence, and you know, I've studied kind of political violence that's taken place from the colonial period all the way through to the present day, and and nearly always you'll see whether it was carried out by Sikhs, whether it was carried out by Palestinians, whether it was carried out by um, the Tamil Tigers, right? What what underpins a lot of this violence is a grievance around um, their their political situation, not so much um, their their belief system. The belief system, like you can it's literally, incidental. you can chop and change the belief yeah. system. Like somebody carrying out an attack based on um, uh, their their leftist thinking. Right, could have happened in exactly the same way based on somebody's Islamic thinking, right? So what is what is consistent amongst all of these acts mm. is, of course, the 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 root causes, the disenfranchisement, the repression, all of these things. And of course, you know, the the, the Western world like hails itself over its um, enlightenment values, but who were the ones that were going around with the infernal machine? in the post-monarchical era, you know, after, straight after the French Revolution, bombing people and buildings. Who are the ones who are going they, around? They, they literally call that terror, isn't it? Remember, yeah. historically, they call that... Um, the whole period, the terror. Yeah, yeah. But it was across the whole of Europe. Yeah. So even in other countries, like Austria and Germany, you had people with Jacobin ideas, which are the same ideas that the Enlightenment is based on, right? Stabbing people... You know, killing them and then like slitting their own throats in the street. Yeah, it wasn't as um, uh, the loss of life wasn't as huge because mm. explosive devices were smaller and you know that interpersonal violence was was less. But this, you know, 
It was based on their value system. But what was really going on, it wasn't because they believed in Jacobin ideals. It's because in universities, their lecturers were getting um, uh, removed from their positions. Their books were being burnt. Yeah. They weren't allowed. They were getting imprisoned for talking <laughs> about these things. That the, across the whole of Europe, the European monarchies were terrified that yeah. their position as monarchies was going to be undermined by these kind of revolutionary ideals. And yeah. so they instituted entire systems of repression, which is where modern policing comes from. Modern day policing and the security state all comes from the desire to repress um, uh, any revolutionary thought, you know, Sounds and, like and it's so interesting that it's been co-opted now by the same liberals yeah. who it was initially brought in by in order to repress other people and their ideas. So these things are in cycles. As soon I as think... you start using repressive met methods, yeah. you're going to get reactions, unfortunately. Assalamu guys. Last reminder, I promise. Head over to islam21c.com forward slash donate to help this movement get to the next level. So we have genuine, high quality media articulating Islam in the 21st century and developing confident Muslims impacting the world for the better. I think the government's um, as, uh, line now is that it accepts that um, what you said about... Um, someone's ideology being somewhat incidental right mm -hmm. uh, and there being other factors and so forth but as you know there's a there's always a gap between you know the lab bench between discovery between the science and when it gets into policy and there's always always that struggle uh, you might be interested to hear that the, I think there was this this quote from one of our um, back back and forth kind of uh, arguments with the government in our case Mm -hmm. uh, about uh, um, the prevent judicial review, there was one really nice line in there. The government, uh, the other side says, the government, the UK government believes that extremism uh, is a is neither necessary nor sufficient cause for terrorism. <laughs> and I thought this should be. <laughs> We've been telling you that for years. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I mean, so the thing is that to do to to stop it requires work that they're unwilling to do right for a start it requires holding up a mirror to themselves okay yeah. for power to hold up a mirror to itself and say what have i done wrong in the situation that's the first thing that needs to happen but the next thing that needs to happen is that they have to look at all of the structural inequalities that exist in society and the problem with capitalism and neoliberalism is that it doesn't want to do that it goes against best, too many vested interests for them to invest in society in the way that society needs to be invested in. It's far cheaper for them. It's far more cost effective for them to house, warehouse, you know, young black and brown people mm -hmm. in prison systems than it is for them to bring about systemic change in society. And that's where we are, uh, that the, they have no desire to bring about the level of change that's needed. You know, Cage produced a report called Beyond Prevent, where we, we list a whole series of, of ways in which we can reduce the threat levels that exist in society. But that requires huge amounts of investment. But investment that ultimately is beneficial for the whole of society. You know, what yeah. we're saying is that, look, you want to end violence, political violence you need to start dealing with all of these root cause issues don't invest money into mental health services because you want to stop uh the next terrorist put money into mental health services because people suffer from mental health issues and they need that and they need to know that they have yeah. that care and concern not that they that their psychiatrist or psychologist is like looking at them as if they're a potential future bomb right yeah. and that's unfortunately what we've been um where we are right now that we're constantly yeah. told that this is how um we need to deal with threats by well, I, I wanted to ask you you know what your view of the future is what are your uh, because you, you published a, a report recently on the 20th birthday of uh, the terrorism act 2000 um can you can you tell us a bit about that and and you know briefly what your what your um recommendations and your observations are for uh, for the future of terrorism legislation and, and policy. Sure, I mean, so the Terrorism Act 2000 is, um, you know, actually predates 9/11. Yeah. So they were they were bringing it in before then anyway. But 
it really sets the tone for all of the legislation that we have in this country, which is unfortunately um, repressive and at, at its, its very, very best. When you have so many pieces of legislation entrenched within the system, it's very difficult to cycle back from that. Mm. Now, my position is that as Muslims, we only have, and you know, generally people of color as well who are affected by these things, we only have one option, which is we must call for the total overhaul of the entire system of terrorism legislation. Like we don't have any choice in the matter, because otherwise, what happens? You get to a stage that we're at right now, with say, for example, the Terrorism Act 2000, which is that pre 9/11 piece of legislation. Uh-huh. Well, all of us as Muslims, we either have experienced ourselves or know someone who has experienced being stopped at an airport. Now, how do we deal with it? We change our lives to match it. We get to the airport earlier than other people do. Comply, we, basically. We, we have, yeah, we have, uh, we've accepted it. We we know that we might be, get questioned. We changed our digital life because of it. Like, I know people who won't keep photos of their children on their phones anymore because they're worried that, you know, um, somebody might might strip that data out of their phone and, and keep it on a database somewhere. So they have people have anxiety about I mean, going. it's normal amongst us, um, our, our kind of circle of brothers, to just have a have a traveling phone. <laughs> right, but, but you know, even worse than that, we make jokes yeah. about, it, right? Yeah, we we laugh about yeah. it because this black humor has entered into like like our form of catharsis. Like, how do we deal with it? Oh, we just make a joke about it, but laugh it's serious it. yeah. because we've accepted that we are being treated differently than everyone else. So just at that level, if that became normalized, and that was almost 20 years ago, what else have we normalized, right? Yeah. What other parts of the system? So every single time they take a piece of our liberty away from us, right, what they do is that they entrench that system and that structure even further. So there is only one option in terms of the future, which is full and complete overhaul and abolition of all of these policies. Further than that, I would argue policing as well, but maybe that's another conversation for another time. <laughs> Bloody hell, <man. laughs> One at a time, bro. <laughs> so, isn't that a bit? So, what if someone says, "Look, that's that's that that's just too um, that's just too radical." What's your practical? I mean, what uh, what other option of... is there, right? Uh, if 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 the if if the call is that we have to be reasonable, right? Reasonable for who? Like you might live your best, you know, kind of um, whitewashed life where you maybe change the names of your kids. Your kids are now called Amy and Poppy, right? And you do everything that you can in order to invisibilize mm. your Muslimness to society. You'll do the things. You'll maybe go out to like parties and drink an orange juice, you know, while everybody else is drinking alcohol and whatever. You'll do what you can. But at some point, it catches up to you. In my PhD, one of the case studies that I uh, I reference, it's not from a, a, an interview that I did, but actually my it was a it was a discussion that my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, had with a. Uh, a young girl, her name is Yasmin. She, uh, you know, in this paper that they they, they co-wrote, she writes that um, the way I live my life, I thought that I was immune to the war on terror. You know, I I was, um, you know, kind of living basically a, a very much a non-Muslim life. I was uh, on holiday with my boyfriend. Uh, in Amsterdam, and when I came back to the UK, I was stun- stopped under the Schedule Seven of the Terrorism Act, uh, and stopped and questioned and interviewed uh, because of my Muslim name. And she goes, and that's the only that was the first time I realised that I was subject to the logic of this war as much as anybody else was, like despite having lived my life in a completely different way than everyone else. And and for me, that case study was so fascinating because, you know, it just shows you how much of a racialized process this is. That, you know, when we give up these rights and these liberties, thinking that they apply to somebody else all the time, they, they inevitably will harm other people, too. So when we say, OK, that's too radical, like, OK, but who are you willing to let go? Who are you willing to be harmed? Because that's the that, that you have to accept that is the ultimate conclusion of what you're saying. Mm. When you say that for abolition is not what we're pushing for, then tell me who are the people in society that you are willing to be harmed 
by these policies because that's what you've just said. What about for okay, devil's advocate here? What about but what what if someone says um, the way w- one counterclaim is um, let's just uh, campaign for some equalities, tick boxing, whatever um, exercise um, to be to be uh, kind of inserted into these uh, these uh, instruments or these these uh, this legislation, so to make sure. That schedule seven, it's you know there's there's some equality uh, data or whatever that the that, that people so we're to. all equally discriminated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean I, I think that that's a fallacious argument for for very 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 obvious reasons. For a start, it would never happen that way anyway. Um, if people if more white people were being stopped, okay, their data would not be viewed in the same suspicion within which we are. Like a white person being stopped is not going to be asked questions around. Um, what his views on Palestine are, or the conflict in Israel, right, or any of these things. Now, the question is, what is a white person going to be asked about, right? They might be asked about maybe like Combat 18 or so-called far-right groups, but are they going to be asked about, well, do you agree with Boris Johnson's view of calling black people having watermelon smiles, for example? No, because the ubiquity of the racism within these structures is that that is not a problem. Right, that Boris Johnson's racism, very overt racism, is not considered a problem. So nobody's going to be asked, "Did you vote for Boris Johnson?" and "Do you agree with his comments about, um, you know, Nagabi women looking like letterboxes?" No one's going to ask that question in the way that we're asked questions about our beliefs and our thoughts. They're never going to be asked questions about what they think about refugees, for example. And the reason for that is clear: that that is not considered an issue. That that is the extent to which racism is ubiquitous. Yeah. Within, um, within the structures of policing that we have, and particularly within terrorism legislation, mm. and so yeah, I think that's that that whole argument is completely down with the system. It has to be. How do you how do you I don't, I don't uh, envisage we do that? I'm, or we just accept the fact that we're second class citizens for the rest of our lives. That's literally the only other option. Then we have to say, okay, fine, we completely accept that we will never have. Um, an equal position in this society that we will never be considered equal. That is the only other option that stems from that from that narrative of we have to let certain things go. There is no other option. So how do you um, what do you propose in terms of kind of practically uh, overturning this this whole terrorism matrix? Are you proposing like we go out on mass and just uh, refuse to uh, comply. Yeah, or, yeah, I would love that. I know. don't think we're politically there yet. I don't yeah. think we're politically conscious enough as a community civil to uh, engage in, in civil be- disobedience just yet. Um, I do think it what is. What we do is uncivil disobedience so far. <laughs> right, right. I think what we do is we normalize our yeah. oppression largely. Like you know, when 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 Muslim community organizations have meetings with the police and say, look, you know, you're you're really making it difficult for us every time they're going through airports, right? And the police give us a prayer mat. During the airport stop, right? That's, that's normalization. Nice that's not that's not benefiting anyone. Yeah. In fact, the last time that I got stopped and I was offered a prayer mat at, uh, for prayer time, I refused. I was like, I'm not I'm not going to be complicit in my own oppression by making you feel better. I refuse to take food. I refuse to take water. I refuse a prayer mat. I want them to know that I'm uncomfortable the whole time. I don't want them to feel even a sousson of of goodness about themselves because they're involved in a racist profiling mm. at that moment. Why should I make them feel good about what, they, what they're doing to me? And I don't think other people should either. I don't think we should be praying. I'd rather... I don't know, like <laughs> I don't think we should time. be praying. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 I'd rather... I'll pray on the floor, man. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, what I'll say is that I feel like I would rather not pray and pray my prayer late than pray in that moment because of how it makes me feel, because of how I don't want to normalize that racism against me. I'm not giving any fatwas here. <laughs> 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 you just but did you understand. But I'm sure you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, about about being. So, if n- enough people do that, will that? I mean, what if what what happens if, like from now, every Muslim hearing this, they just refuse to comply at schedule schedule seven stop? Then the Is, system would 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 get clogged up, and people could get uh, arrested for for non compliance. So. Um, what, what, and I, 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 honestly, for me, that's the, really the only option, um, because I don't think um, bringing about, um, you know, terrorism 
uh, reviews and independent reviewers has done anything to help us, to assist us in any way. If, if anything, all it's done is to to normalize it, to say, oh, like we just need better training, right? But you know, and the the ironic thing about the independent review system, right? Better is training to spot the Muslim. <laughs> he sits he sits in the interview, okay, while the interview is taking place. That the interviewer knows that the independent reviewer is watching him, right? And so, you know, when he comes out and he says, you know, I've sat through a number of interviews and they all seem to be perfectly professional in the way that they carried out, right? That's because you weren't there when Riz Ahmed, right, who writes in uh, about his experience in, um, what's that book again? Um, oh, The Good Immigrant. It's a superb essay in The Good Immigrant that, that the actor Riz Ahmed writes about, mm. right? You know, he's not there when they're, they're asking all these questions about your positions on, on foreign policy and on the Palestine conflict and the war in Iraq and so many other things, right? Yeah. And so, you know, that whole process is a complete nonsense. Look, you know, people like to talk about Martin Luther King a lot, right? Like the, the, there is a huge misuse of his history, especially by Muslims, right? Who, who say that, oh, we need to engage like Martin Luther King one. Like, but people forget that he was involved in, in marching at the threat of his own life. He was involved in um, going to prison, you know, for the sake of his beliefs. He was involved with, you know, the Alabama bus boycott, right? Of course, he wasn't on his own. You had, like, his wife, Coretta Scott King, who really, like, gave him the political awareness to do many of these things, right? But the point is, is that, you know, we need to have He was have a radical. That... Oh, but he was a radical. <laughs> yeah. By our standards, by he the Muslim extremist. community standards, by the Muslim community standards, Martin Luther King was a radical. Right. He wasn't yeah. he wasn't uh, at all like he would right now be considered a troublemaker amongst the level of political thinking that we're out within the community. Martin Luther King would have been considered a, a troublemaker. He wouldn't but, have been considered but, okay. that his, his legacy is misused yeah. right now okay. you know, because we don't because he was somebody he didn't accept that discriminatory legislation was acceptable. He said, I'd rather yeah. go to prison disobeying um, uh, uh, an unconscionable law, right, than to abide by that unconscionable law. And we're not there you know, at all. And I think Muhammad Rabani is like one of the best examples of somebody who has taken a position. And he was not alone. There have been a few others as well. But they took a position. They, they chose not to engage. They, they, they chose to, uh, you know, risk imprisonment for the sake of holding on to their values and i think that's an important example for us Absolutely. all um let's just uh, be a bit uh, responsible and and highlight the the actual risks people might be taking if they if they act upon this yeah so but i'm not I'm, but uh, i said i'm not we're not at that political yeah, level yeah but if somebody just needed. somebody uh, if they if if somebody in the next shadow seven stop does refuse to give them their passwords and phone mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff what can they expect by way of uh, oh they can they can, ex they can potentially expect arrest non-compliance so right? what's the worst that could happen like, legally to them what can they what can they do how long would they be arrested for and and how big of a crime I mean, is it you know potentially they could face a um an up to three month imprisonment uh, uh sentence i think they are trying to change that now to make it longer i, I, I don't know exactly where the legislation is going uh, at the moment but um and i think it might be under a different um, provision as well but the point is that you know the, the point that ultimately i was trying to make um, really isn't like everybody should just go out there and do this, start doing these things randomly. Yeah. That you know, movement building, which is what's required here, okay. right, yeah. uh, requires thought, it requires mobilizing together, it requires Muslims coming together with one another, different organizations, institutions saying, yes, we realize that we are being discriminated against, that we are second class citizens in this country, and that we have to now start mobilizing alongside one another, right? Right now, like, if you asked another Muslim organization to march against being stopped at the airport, they'd be like, what are you talking about? It's just normal now, right? <laughs> that's that's how normalized it's yeah. become. You know, so if you're watching this, don't go and get arrested just yet. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't do it. It requires Sweet. much more mobilization yeah, to think yeah. these things through. Okay, we'll look forward to that, inshallah. Uh, cage to lead the way. Um, I'm conscious of time. I just wanted to ask uh, just a quick, and the question's quick, your answer might, be, uh, might not be so, but... Um, how do you think the pandemic, right, the, the current coronavirus pandemic, mm. how has it been exploited uh, by power? And what do you think the future is for, for that struggle? I mean, I think my first thought about the pandemic is really um, much more to do with 
neoliberalism than it has to do with anything else, which is we see the extent to which the economy as a, a pervasive um, uh, necessity, right, is is placed above all else, including human life, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, so many of the tweet threads that you see about people saying, oh, so I, if I do this, then that's okay. But if I do this, then that's not okay. And in this situation, in that situation, right? The confusion around the rules is because this government is desperate power is desperate to make sure that the oils of the economy keep on turning that is the overwhelming priority so mm. human life i think if, if nothing proved that human life to those in power is meaningless compared to the needs of you know kind of greasing the machinery for the economy then this pandemic really proved it now alongside that what they've done is to exploit it by by trying to bring in like um you know, kind of all this legislation that gives them emergency powers. But the question is, like, why? Like, why do you need powers to kind of detain people, you know, when you can just take really reasonable approaches to how you educate and and work with your communities? But the reality is, is that any kind of exceptional situation will always be exploited by those in power to do to, to to take more powers for themselves right yeah. and so you know we see a, a reinforcement of policing we see a reinforcement of of control of society um but ultimately if you ask them to really take care of people's lives you know it's something that they've been unwilling to do and i think that's that's really the huge yeah. tragedy of this this isn't about terrorism legislation or muslims or whatever it might be yes you know bmi people are are more uh, at risk but really ultimately this is about how neoliberalism as an ideology yeah. it is um it is killing us literally um and while we especially as a muslim community constantly feed into the idea that we want a piece of that pie then we reinforce that violence every single day you know as long as you know all we want is to be neoliberal muslims i think that we we only reinforce those structures of of violence so that's how it is that's what 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 the the kind of state that that, that's what the pandemic has uncovered for us what do you think are the changes that it's done to society moving forward how do you and how do we what what's your uh, message about that about muslims being careful and and uh, in the post-pandemic world i mean like in terms of muslims then you know for us the whole notion of well, we'll meet whatever the government's guidelines are is, you know, that should never even, you know, necessarily factor into our equations, right? For us, our starting point always should be, what is the ethical and the right thing to do in this situation based on my particular circumstances? We all have a brain, you know. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave us the ability to think, to interact with this Deen in a way that is that is holistic, right? So if going to the masjid is something that might be harmful to a vulnerable, potentially harmful to a vulnerable person in your house, right? Then in that circumstance, like, you know, the beauty of the deen is that what the locus of what is most ethical mm. in that moment changes, right? And so for so for me, the starting point always is like, you have to, we first, as Muslims, we have to look at our individual situations and say, okay, there is all this prophetic guidance about how we're supposed to act and operate in a period of um, of a plague, a pandemic, of any yeah. of these types of things, right? <laughs> the question I, you have, we always have to ask ourselves is how are my actions potentially harmful to another? Because if you harm other people, then this goes against what we believe in the, in, the, in, in terms of the Sharia. The, the sanctity of life is a maqsad that is so high that it, in some circumstances, can even potentially override ingesting haram. Yeah. And override so many other aspects of the deen, right? And yet, we like we, we we treat government's guidance as if it's some kind of like, you know, uh, divine law. Forget about that. Okay, we have to make these decisions first from an ethical position. Then we see what the government's guidelines are and what's practicable and what's not, right? Yeah. And you know, in terms of how we how we move forward, then I think it is. Every single masjid needs to make its it, it, its determination around how to protect not only the Muslims within its jama'ah, but also wider society, 
yeah. right? We can't go around harming other people either, right? You know, something that, you know, my wife and I are constantly telling our kids about, you know, wearing a mask, about not touching things, about, we're, and we're not, we're, we don't frame it according to this is what government's guidelines is. <laughs> we frame it according to this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants in order to keep other people safe, that, so we can't be culpable for harming another human being. The ethics have mm -hmm. to take priority over anything else. Okay, excellent. Zakum la khairan, bro. I'm conscious of time, so uh, okay. I'll let you uh, get along. Uh, really, thanks for joining us. Uh, and thank you at home for watching. Uh, if you like this podcast, give a like and a share. Remember to uh, get involved in the comments. Anything you agreed with, disagreed with, you want to uh, take Asim or myself out, then uh, feel free to do so. Uh, if you want to take our relationship to the next level, remember to subscribe, hit that bell notification. Uh, if you see one, uh, you'll be at the front of the queue whenever we post something new. Also, another reminder, where, wherever you get your podcasts, so Apple, Spotify, CastBox, Google, all that kind of good stuff. But uh, until next time, that's it from me and the Sam Trinancy team. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.